Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Malvern Books. Thank you all so much for coming. We are very excited to have CD and Jack here. Uh, and celebrating CD's debut novel. Um, we're going to start out with Jack, and then we'll have CD come up here. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So hold on to those questions. There is one copy of CD's book left. So maybe battle royale for it? <laughs> uh, just okay. gonna say all fights need to happen outside. outside. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Good. The parking awesome. lot is a very exciting terrain for such a thing. Jack Kalfas is the author of the short story collection Tomorrow or Forever. Jack is a graduate of the University of Texas and Texas State University. Oh, that sounds funny. <laughs> and they teach high school English here in Austin. Please welcome Jack. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, thinking of me to come and read. Um, it's very much an honor to read uh, right, be right before you. <clears throat> so um, my book of short stories is right back there. It came out last year with a small press called Transgress Press. Um, they're a little independent out of Oakland, California. Um, am I speaking in the microphone okay? Yeah. Okay, everybody can hear? All right, great. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but this uh, the, this thing that I'm going to read is actually from my novel in progress. Uh, do not worry, it has been workshopped a couple times. It's not just like I wrote it last night or something like that. Uh, people have looked at it and been, you know, it's ready to read. Um, and if you do like this, uh, um, then you might like some of my stories, which are fantastic, a little bit, uh, a little bit strange, uh, definitely dealing with a lot of queer issues and issues around sort of living in Texas and then rural areas where um, you basically people want to kill you. Just, you know, <clears throat> America. So this is from my novel and uh, it's called Blood Makes, <clears throat> excuse me, Blood Makes Noise. Um, the novel is largely about, uh, it's about a, like a little queer collective uh, who live in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Georgia. And it's set in the near future, like maybe 2030s. I don't know, I'm still, uh, right now it's around 2035. Um, it's a little bit of a cult-like situation there, um, although they don't believe it is. Uh, it features maybe some extrasensory powers brought on by uh, pharmaceutical cocktails that are personalized. Um, but it's also it's disguised as an organic farm. Uh, in this scene, uh, one of the members, whose name is Vic, uh, she has traveled home to Texas to try to convince an old friend to move to the farm without telling her that like there's also a bunch of other cult shit going on. Just It's just an organic farm. And so um, they decide to take a little side trip to Port Aransas to blow off some steam, and um, they end up going into Corpus Christi. <clears throat> we drove downtown to pick up some coffee and tacos before setting out for the day. Every few hundred yards, something was being reconstructed to look old and weathered. Pastel clabbered houses on stilts, squat beach huts full of shells, restaurant porches cluttered with photo-ready, life-size sea animals made of concrete. I wondered what kind of person it took to rebuild on a, an island so close to certain death. Uh, I uh, is Jane. The main street took us past the ferry and over the seawall bridge into Corpus Christi, which had blown away in the early 20s and been semi-rebuilt rebuilt as a hurricane-proof fortress. I'd not left Austin since the first global event, but everyone knew the air was still pretty good on the coast and the wind kept the temperatures tolerable. The seawall was about 25 feet high, made of concrete reinforced with recycled rebar and covered in a waterproof plastic sheeting rumored to be toxic to sea life. Most of the folks who chose Corpus after the first global event were old school preppers with good carpentry skills, or they were hippies who wanted to live in shipping containers from the beginning. Though there was little water, people seemed to make do with rations and collected rain from the spring thunderstorms that tumbled off the water. Corpus was next in line for a new desalination plant like the ones that kept Houston in fresh water and jobs, but that was still a good decade off. Why do they even bother, Vic muttered as we crested the bridge. The city spread south and west, walled off from the bay on the east and north sides, 
and we could see maybe a mile in all directions. The streets and highways still visible, though some had been dug up in places and replaced with farmland. Structures were mostly small, utilitarian, and though some of the squat downtown buildings had been fully rebuilt, most places looked like they had been patched together with airplane glue and mud. It's worse than I thought, I said, imagining cannibal gangs from Mad Max roaming the neighborhood streets below. On the other side of the wall, the very light was different. I rolled the window down a bit, and the air that entered was nothing like the sea wind on Port Aransas. This side of the wall was chemical, earthen, unmoving. Let's go back to the island, I said, rolling up the window and switching the AC to filter. Vic looked at me, reached for my hand, and I let her take it. Don't be nervous, she said. We, let's just hang out for like an hour. It only takes a minute to die, I said, but I threaded my fingers through hers and brought, my hand, brought her hand to my lap, relieved that last night's discomfort had not lingered. I've been thinking about something you said last night, Vic said, making a right off the bridge's four-lane highway and into a dinky neighborhood street in serious need of repair. The seawall loomed on our right. And I really, I, I just think the farm would be a good place for you. I already said I would think about it, I said. I pointed to a skinny dog trotting down the street as we hit a pothole and went lurching forward. A dog looks rabid. Well, Vic said, let's not touch that dog. She consulted the car screen and made another turn to stay close to the wall. No, I mean it. I mean, I want you to come back to the farm and I want you to come back with me. She gave me a quick smile. The roads nearest the wall are kept up pretty well, she said, but um, that's a crazy sinkhole. Uh, and so she pulled into a weedy yard. Or so I read. Will you be embarrassed if I turn out to be a bad farmer? I asked. Mitch will be happy to hear you're handy with a blowtorch, Vic said, and maybe maybe you have other talents we just don't know about. We followed the wall another 15 minutes or so, passing groups of rusting freight cars propped on cinder blocks in the shadow of the wall. The wall itself was covered in a graffiti, the plastic sheeting so thick and heavy it undulated slowly, almost organically, in the low wind. Most places were tagged in bright, beautiful letters, some 15 feet high, some 3D. The absence of the sea was palpable. Even the bite of salt in the air was somehow diminished. I saw only a few people here and there standing in their yards. One man in full camo gear stood atop a fresh wooden deck with a broom. He shooed a child back inside the window with silo behind him. When the child was safely inside, he gave us the finger and continued sweeping. <laughs> We're almost there, Vic said, pulling the car onto gravel road, leading to a sunken brown field. She squinted at the screen and zoomed in on a satellite image. This is a cemetery? This is a very special cemetery, she said. Come on. Vic parked and jumped out, pulling her phone from her front pocket. I followed. The field was empty of markers, but there were still some worn paths between the plots and a few makeshift stones with recent dates had been laid out for new graves. You know, I gotta tell you, so this is where Selena's buried, Vic said. Or maybe she was once buried here, I don't know. Selena the singer, I said. I could not believe that was the reason we had to cross the sea wall. Okay, so Risha's made us all fans now. Risha's someone who's back on the farm. Risha's made us all fans now, <clears throat> but I wanted to see if there was something here, something left of her gravesite. Vic snapped a picture of one of the small tombstones that had been pushed into the earth at the head of a freshly packed mound of dirt. No way, I said. When Corpus was hit, there, there were bones washing up in people's attics. The only dead people still in their caskets are the ones buried in mausoleums like 10 miles inland. This is why we came over the wall. I could have told you this, Vic. A woman watched us from behind the, from behind the bars of an open window, her apartment complex overlooking the cemetery had been rebuilt with white bricks salvaged from some kind of church. There were still crosses carved into some of the larger stones. I waved at her and she disappeared. Vic looked at me. This is only stop one, Jane. Back in the truck, Vic adjusted the screen and I reached into the cooler between us for a bottle of water. The water must be a real problem, I said, thinking about the woman in the window. Well, what will you do in Austin? What do you mean? It's only a matter of time, really, Jane, before Austin's dry as Phoenix. Like, you'll have maybe a decade left with the aquifer. How do you know that? I read up. I was headed back to Texas before I decided to move to the farm. I like Austin and everything, but I like being alive more. <laughs> we'll figure something out, I said. 
I knew that water rationing was part of the platforms of all the city council running for office that spring. You're gonna figure it out like Corpus did? She said, they had plenty of warning. Come on. I looked around at the rubble in front of abandoned buildings we passed, at the house high hills of mud that had still not been carted or washed away. Next to some of these piles of garbage was were entirely rebuilt homes with what passed for yards. No real grass had come back, but there were patches of green showing through some of the sand and rocky debris at the side of the road. Austin's not Corpus. Right, Austin is not Corpus, but I think Austin is the next Cape Town. Cape Town has been a ghost town for three years. On the list for the, sorry, <coughs> the salination plant as well. Because of the South African laws, though, no one has been allowed to remain, not like Corpus. Vic turned out of the neighborhood at the north end of the cemetery and checked the time. Okay, so we got 45 minutes. Um, <clears throat> keep your eyes on the road. We hit the city center where there, were, um, with the, there was more life on the streets. Electricity had been restored to many of the buildings. And there was even a Whataburger flashing an open sign. Vic maneuvered through the dangerous looking cracks in the main thoroughfare and pulled into a parking lot of an abandoned strip mall. This was the museum, she said, bringing up a site map on her screen. Come on, if you haven't been to this museum, you need to go on Corpus, the Selena Museum, and it's really fantastic. The sun was out now, and I immediately started sweating. We didn't have any protection either from the sun or from other people. There was no one in sight, but that didn't mean people weren't around. Vic looked down at her phone and pointed at one of the storefronts with a giant spider web crack in the window. That's our place. She tried the door, which swung open as though we had been expected. You think Austin's gonna end up like this? Probably, yeah, but the old hippies will stick around and forage. They'll just be happy the Californians are gone. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to worry about any of this on the farm, I said. Vic shrugged. I don't know the future, I can't tell the future. But I do know we have plenty of fresh water, unspoiled air, and a fuck ton of Tristan's family money. Vic glanced back at me and then pulled me through the door. Inside, it was obvious that even though the place had flooded, it had been picked clean of everything but dirt and dangerously sharp objects. Broken glass littered the floor and crunched beneath every step. There's nothing left, I said, examining an old glass case that had once held three of Selena's onstage dresses. There was a little placard at the bottom. I brushed it clean so I could make out the words. I'd only heard of Selena, knew little about her music, in my generation, the tragedy of her sudden murder had come to outweigh her work, but I was struck by the little faded placard. In a city ravaged by loss and destruction, here was an evidence of life and love and memory. It's perfect, Vic smiled. She put it in her pocket. On the way back to the car, we were approached by a woman in a wide-brimmed straw hat with a loud, in a long white caftan. She looked out of place in a desolate parking lot. Sun exposure had rendered her ageless, she could have been 35, she could have been 65. We don't get many tourists anymore, she said. Are you here by accident? I couldn't tell if her tone was friendly, but she didn't look armed. No, Vic said, just visiting for the day. She leaned coolly against the car, shaking a cigarette out of a pack. The morning, really, I said. We have friends, a lot of friends that are expecting us in the afternoon in Port Aransas, across the seawall. The woman nodded, a flash of the sun, of her sunglasses temporarily blinded me. Vic pulled our stolen souvenir out of her pocket and showed it to the woman. Do you know where we can get like a real gift for a Selena super fan? Huh, said the woman. Maybe a cigarette will jog my memory. Mm -hmm. Thanks, y'all.